Those of us that enjoy the limestone landscape seldom stop to consider the huge part that this limestone rock plays in our everyday lives. The infrastructure of modern living depends heavily on the use of limestone and many other minerals. Man has always made use of the natural resources around him. At first it was the loose rock that lay on the ground, but soon more sophisticated stone structures were making greater use of what rock was locally available. The builders were also starting to use lime mortar to bind the rocks together. There is evidence that limestone has been burned to produce lime since the 17th century. Old lime kilns are a common sight in the Yorkshire Dales. The quick lime they produced was commonly used to spread on the fields where it sweetened the acidic soil and improved the grazing. But it was also used to produce lime mortar. Monastic buildings, castles, medieval manors all demanded large quantities of locally available rock. The stone used for construction was mostly sandstone because its fairly soft granular structure meant that it could be easily carved in a whole variety of shapes. However, large quantities of lime mortar were also needed to bind the rock together and the walls are often then finished with a coat of lime wash. Limestone, as well as sandstone, was in great demand. Gritstone too. Grinding wheels were required both to grind wheat into flour and to sharpen tools. With all of these increasing demands, quarries started to become a regular feature of the landscape. The grain market for lime eventually demanded more efficient types of lime kiln. The Toffgate Quarry near Pateley Bridge was built somewhere around the 1820s and was designed to burn continuously. Stonebreakers including children broke the quarried limestone into fist sized pieces which were probably fed into the quarry by a steam crane. Experienced lime burners fed coal into the eight furnaces halfway down the vertical kiln. Heat drawn in from these produced a temperature of over 800 degrees centigrade, the temperature needed to produce quicklime. Over five centuries, lime was extracted from the base of this kiln, loaded into lime carts and transported all over the country. 20 or so miles away to the west, in Lancliffe, an even more advanced type of continuous burn kiln was built. The Hoffman kiln used a horizontal design in the shape of an elongated donut. The quarried broken limestone was stacked into the circular burning chamber. Around the outside of the ring were spaced 22 individual fireboxes. They were burned in turn, slowly progressing the fire around the circle, while a complicated flue system controlled the heat flow through the limestone. As the fire moved around, so the resulting called quick lime could be shoveled out quickly into waiting railway trucks. The Industrial Revolution would create even bigger demands. The rapidly growing cities needed water, and water meant reservoirs. In the 1890s, work began on two large dams in Upper Nidderdale. The water would be carried to the city of Bradford by a 50 kilometre long viaduct. It was to be a massive feat of engineering, employing over a thousand workers, and the complete project would take nearly 50 years to finish. The locally available sandstone will be used for all of the impressive exterior masonry of the dams and the associated structures. But the core of the dams was to be cast from a million tonnes of concrete, and that needed limestone. This 
and many other minerals would need to be brought in from further afield. A special light railway had to be built along the valley to bring in all of these necessary materials, plus the heavy machinery and at least the many workers. The latter would be housed in a specially constructed village there on the hillside. Scar Village had his own church, shops and eventually a cinema. The sandstone was to be quarried high up on either side of the valley. The rock was then transported to the construction site using railway trucks via an inclined track which used natural gravity but was controlled by a wire cable. On occasion it was even used to transport visiting officials up to the quarries. These days, Upper Nidale is a quiet place. A pathway climbs the old railway incline up to the abandoned quarries. Lengths of the original wire cable lie rusting in the grass. And at the head of the track, the heavy concrete base of the control tower can still be seen. A few lonely sandstone blocks stand like monuments to those who once worked in these now silent quarries. The quarry was clearly an excellent source of material. The rock is almost naturally divided into usable blocks. Nevertheless, a line of drill holes shows how the rock was split when it was necessary. The old quarrying method called plugs and feathers was used. It involved driving metal wedges into the drilled holes until the rock was forced to crack. Now the village, the people, the industry and the railway all have gone. The reservoirs remain and they will silently serve the people of Bradford for many years to come. The rapid growth in demand for the new building materials, cement and concrete, soon largely replaced the need for quicklime. Our cities, our roads, our railways and industry every year demand more and more limestone. Now the quarries have to be on a much larger scale to economically supply the growing demand and the impact they have on the landscape and on the local community have become a major consideration. Most people that drive across the open landscapes towards Pateley Bridge are unaware of the scale of the quarrying operation that has been carefully screened from their view. Goldstone's Hill has been a source of limestone for more than 200 years. At the present time, something like half a million tonnes of limestone rock is removed from this hill every year. This raw rock will be crushed and sorted according to the requirements of how and where it is to be used. And the uses are many. I think its main thing is its versatility. It has many, many uses. It's a hard aggregate and is used in construction and buildings, used for building blocks, used in concrete and cement. Most of the built structures you see around you will use large quantities of limestone. Society wouldn't really survive without excellent limestone going into their buildings. There's more strange uses, things like the steel industry, it's used for fluxing steel. It's even used in the production of sugar. Uh, sugar in its process when it's been changed from sugar beet 
uses a good deal of limestone. And just to counteract that, it's also using toothpaste which cleans your teeth up after you've rotted them with the sugar that's been produced. Yet it is cement and concrete that are at the very core of our construction industry. Near Clitheroe in Lancashire, most of the required materials can be quarried locally, and the limestone is particularly suitable for cement production. The process is based around a rotary kiln, in which a mixture of limestone, clay, and additional materials according to things like the purity of the limestone are heated to a temperature of 1450 degrees centigrade as they pass along its length. The resulting clinker is then finely ground to the fine grey powder that is so familiar to all of us, ready to be packed for shipment. Each year, this factory produces over three quarters of a million tonnes of cement, while the world demand is expected to be approximately three billion tonnes a year. For instance, every day a train like this will carry up to a thousand tonnes of cement up to Scotland. Cement and concrete are a vital part of our modern way of life. With the exception of water, it is the most common material used by mankind. The quarries inevitably get bigger as the demand increases. Soon, many of those operating will reach their limit. We will need more quarries, but where? How much of the landscape are we prepared to sacrifice to provide our basic needs? future generations will inevitably face difficult and perhaps painful choices. <laughs> <laughs>